Hi guys, we're going to talk about exam number two in CH 142. So that's the chapter, chapters uh, 15 and 16. So equilibrium and intro to acids and bases. All right, so the first question is asking us to uh, figure out what will be a basic solution. So our choices are HNO3, which of course is nitric acid, so that's going to be acidic. Uh, let's see, ammonium nitrate, sodium nitrate, and sodium carbonate. All right, so there's a couple ways to approach this. In class, we practiced doing a dissociation and then doing a hydrolysis of each part. Uh, this one, I don't need to do that because it's already an acid. I know it's going to be an acidic solution. No questions asked. Um, it's also a, a good policy generally to remember which ions would make a strong acid or a strong base should they hydrolyze with water. We remember everything in group one makes strong bases, so that's not going to actually happen. And the nitrates also make strong acid, it makes nitric acid. Uh, so those pieces are not going to affect pH at all. So I kind of cross them off just so I don't waste my time. And then you can write a hydrolysis reaction for whatever remains. Here the ammonium is, well it can be written two ways. You can either think that this is a positive charge, so it's going to take the hydroxide, which would be true, or you can think of it as this having an extra hydrogen. Either way, you're going to see we get to produce acidic solution, H plus or H3O plus, depending on how you write that. So we covered that in class. Uh, either way gets you to the same place. I don't care which one you use. The other thing to remember, of course, is that cations are either neutral, like our sodium, or they're going to uh, be acidic. Those are the only two choices for a cation. Uh, this is an anion, carbonate has a two minus charge, so if we put it with water, it's going to steal the hydrogen and leave behind hydroxide. That, of course, makes this a basic solution. Number two is asking for what is the least acidic. Um, our choices, oh, they give us words. So I don't know what chlorous acid is right off the top of my head, but I know where we can look. I'm just copying these questions down. Um, melonic is the last one. So when I'm given acids that I don't know off the top of the head of my head, I I'm going to use the appendix in the book, appendix D here. So let's see, we had a lactic acid listed there. Let's see if we can find that. I don't like the online version of our textbook as much as I used to. Um, it's a little fuzzy looking. So lactic acid is this one, and it has a value of 1.4 times 10 to the negative 4. And then we got chlorous acid and malonic. Melonic's right below lactic, so that's convenient. Oh, it has two Ks. This is going to be the one that's dominant, so that's the one I'm going to record. The other one has a small effect, but mostly this is what's going to dictate the pH. Um, let's see. Chlorous acid is probably up higher, I guess. Um, yep, there it is. 1.1 times 10 to the negative 2. Now the last one isn't an acid, it doesn't have the word acid in it, so I'm not going to find it in the first page of Appendix D, but I recognize that lactic acid is the conjugate of lactate. So this is going to be a KB, right? It's going to be a base, lactate. Whatever lactic acid is, it's going to be the opposite, of whatever you get when you lose that hydrogen. So lactic acid is this, right? So I like the condensed structure because it shows me that that hydrogen is going to pop off, and so lactate is just this piece. And of course, we know sodium doesn't impact pH, so you could figure out the value of that Kb if you wanted to, of course, by um, using Kw divided by Ka, but we don't really need to do that. The question asks us for what is the least acidic thing, so in other words, what's the most basic thing? 
these are all acids. This is the most acidic one because the number is the smallest, meaning this is the largest overall value if you wrote this in standard notation. So that means that the, the least acidic thing is going to be sodium lactate because it's a base. All right, number three, what is the base dissociation constant of propionate, which is the conjugate of propionic acid? Okay, so we're going to use this again. We're looking for propionic acid. Here it is. It has a Ka of 1.3 times 10 to the negative 5. So it's asking for the conjugate. So again, I'm going to use Kw divided by Ka. All right, so in this case, we're assuming it's room temperature as usual. Nothing in the question makes me think otherwise. Okay, so, so from the calculator says it's about 7.7, .7, I rounded there just for convenience, times 10 to the negative 10. So I look at the choices and let's see here. So it looks like there isn't a choice for times 10 to the negative 10. I'm guessing I changed the acid and forgot to change the answers. So that's my mistake. I think most of you are probably going to pick C because it has the right digits and the wrong exponent. But I'm not going to actually count this one against you. I'm going to exclude that from our calculation unless everybody got it all right and I'll give you a free extra credit point. We'll see how that question goes when I grade. All right, so number four is uh, I want to make a solution. Um, I have 200 milliliters, which is our volume, of course, and I want to make 0 0.5 molar. So big M, I automatically translate to be moles per liter. Uh, so if I, I knew how many liters this is, then I could cancel the liters there so I can convert. I'll get just dimensional analysis here, so this is review. So in order to, to make this solution, I, I need to figure out how many moles are involved. So we go 0.5 times 200 divided by 1,000. And we get 0.1 moles. All right, and then it wants us to figure out a mass. OK, well, so acetic acid is CH3COOH. So our molar mass is going to be two carbons plus four hydrogens altogether, three here, one there, and two oxygens. Oops, I did that math too quickly. All right, um, so our molar mass is gonna be sixty point zero six grams per mil, or sorry, grams per mole, okay. Um, so if I have this many moles, I just got to multiply because that'll cancel moles. So this is your basic stoichiometry type problem. 0.1 times 60 is going to be about 6 grams. So the best answer for number 4 is D. All right, 5. We want to see what's not true. All right, so A is the rates of the four reverse reactions are equal. That's definitely true. So it's, it's not going to be A. B is the solution contains products and reactants. That's always true of any equilibrium um, because they go back and forth. The reactions proceed forward and backward continuously. That's true, so it's not that. I'm hoping D is, is our not true. The concentrations of all reactants and products are equal. Okay, that is not always true. It's almost never true. In order for that to be true, the Ka and Kb, or the K forward and K backward, would have to be identical, which is kind of rare. So that's number five. Number six on page two, we're trying to calculate a, a equilibrium constant. Oh, so it gives us a Kc. So that's the equilibrium constant if you think about the pressure. Um, when we write our, our Kc, it would be the products divided by the reactants. And so we'll have Hi. It's squared because it has a coefficient of 2, and it's going to be divided by H2 and I2. So this is our, our definition. It helps me to write this down so I can visualize what's happening. So if this is greater than 1, 
then we have more products than we do reactants. And this 64 is greater than 1. So A and B don't make any sense. It would not be an equilibrium if that were true. The reactants might be dominant, but then this would be like a decimal value, meaning that the, the denominator is bigger than the numerator. So the best choice here is going to be D. Number seven. For the same reaction, we this is referring actually to reaction six, not two. Um, I corrected that in one class, but not in the other. No one caught it in, this, in the morning class, I think. But there wasn't a reaction in reaction two, so hopefully you just referred to the one above. Um, so reaction six. The KC at 490 degrees, so slightly warmer. All right, so the logic here, we're, we're increasing the temperature, and so the KC has increased. So increasing the temperature has caused, well, if it's increased the KC, that means our numerator has gotten bigger, which means I have more products. Uh, so B is the best choice then. Number eight. So same reaction, same problems. If increasing temperature makes more products, you could say shifts to the right. That's what making more products mean. Anytime something shift, increasing temperature shifts something to the right, it has to be endothermic because heat is uh, whatever other reactants you've got. Okay, so if I increase a reactant, it shifts to the right. When we increased heat, we saw that it shifted to the right. So that means that this reaction has to be endothermic. Um, so A is the best choice there. Number nine. Okay, so this is a comparison. Um, we want to, if, if we're talking about pressure, we're talking about gas phase. Anything that's not a gas is not affected by increasing the pressure. So the first example, A, we have a solid plus a gas gets to a solid. That one's not going to shift. So A is not going to shift when you change the pressure because it's it's solids, right? The gas pressure would increase, but that's not going to change anything because there's no gas on the other side. Um, so then let's see. The next reaction has all gases, and so what we can do is count particles. We have two on the on the left and three on the right. For C, everything's a gas. Again, we have two and two on that one. I'm just counting the coefficients, adding them up. Uh, in D, we have two and two again. So I'm going to guess it's not C or D because they won't change with pressure since there's no driving force. They have an equal number of particles on both sides. So that means B is the only, uh, is the optimal answer. Okay, so that was number nine. So now we're gonna move on to number 10. Okay, so they're telling us the reaction is endothermic. Endo means energy goes into it. So you don't have to rewrite this, of course, it's already there in your test, but I'm gonna write it down so you can see what I'm thinking. Okay, so there's our reaction. Endothermic means heat goes here. All right, so the fact that it's endothermic means I put heat on the reaction side, reactant side. Uh, all right, so we want to make as much SO2 as we can. So uh, I want to shift the reaction to the right. So I want to make more products. So if I increase the heat or I increase this or I decrease these, all of those will shift that reaction to make more SO2. Um, so, let's see, we want to increase temperature. So right away, I am going to eliminate A and B, because this is lower the temperature. Lowering the temperature would shift it to the left, because heat is a reactant. And then I just got to have to decide whether it's low pressure or high pressure. So we have two particles on the left and three on the right. Uh, we want to favor the one where higher particles are formed, so that would mean lower pressure. Lower pressure gives things more room, so they don't collide as often, which means I don't go backwards as often. So we're looking for high temperature, 
and low pressure, which is C. Number 11, a catalyst. Okay, so a catalyst changes your, you know, instead of having a really high uh, delta E, this would look more, more like that, I guess. That's terrible. Hang on. Okay, so this is, is what the uncatalyzed reaction would look like. And if we add a catalyst, it's not going to change the reactant concentrations or energies, but it does decrease your activation energy. So you get a lower hill. So that's what I remember about catalysts. Um, so it says the effect a catalyst has on an equilibrium is to increase the rate of the forward reaction. Only that can't be true because you're, you're lowering the hill in the forward and the reverse direction. So it's not A. It does not shift the equilibrium. Catalysts affect both sides of the equilibrium equally. Um, it does not increase the equilibrium constant because if something increases the equilibrium constant, that means it's shifting to the right. Um, but it does lower EA, so I guess we're going to pick D. Change the cursor back to black again. Okay, so 12 is page 3. A substance capable of acting as both an acid and a base. So this is a vocab question. 12 saturated means, uh, that's way back in the solutions chapter. It means I've dissolved as much solute as I can. Missable means two things mix. Missable, mixable, they sound similar. Conjugates are um, opposites. Acids and bases have conjugates. You can't have one thing be its own conjugate. But e amphoteric, ampho, amphi means like amphibian. Two, so D. Okay, 13 is in a neutral solution. I know that hydrogen and hydro hydroxide are going to be equal. So let's see. Oh, it's saying hydronium instead of hydrogen ion, but that's the same thing. So I'm going to pick B. They have to be equal to be neutral. If it was more acidic, it would be, you know, more hydronium. If it was more basic, it would be hydroxide. We want to know which solution below has the highest concentration of hydrogen ion. So in other words, which one is the most acidic? I'm looking for most acidic. So I'm looking for the lowest pH. That's what it means to have a high hydrogen constant. Oops, I forgot pH. High hydrogen ion concentration it means low pH. So B is the best choice for that one. Number 15, fluoride ion, so F minus, um, is a weak base. So that means, oh, all right, so a weak base is going to do this with its conjugate. It's going to be at equilibrium. So they're both going to be present in the solution. So let's see what it, the choices are. Aqueous solutions of fluoride ion contain equal concentrations of hydrogen and hydroxide. That cannot be true because then it would be a neutral solution, and it just said it was a weak base. B, it cannot be neutralized by a weak acid. No, you can totally neutralize bases with acids. Doesn't matter whether they're weak or strong. Um, fluoride dissociates completely in aqueous solutions. No, that would only be true if it was a strong base. Strong bases dissociate completely. Um, so not C. D, fluoride ion will exist in solution with its conjugate. Oh, wow, that's what we just wrote. So I'm gonna guess that's probably right. But let's check E anyway. He says fluoride produces a gas when neutral. Well, nah. The only thing you ever get when you neutralize a base is a salt and water. Never a gas. You only get gases when you react um, acids with metals. Well, not only, but that's typically where you see it. Number 16, the pH of an aqueous solution. Oh, all right, so our pH equation is this. All right, and so it gives us an H plus concentration. So all I got to do is know how to use my calculator. Okay, uh, so, all right, so the calculator says 2.85. So pretty acidic, and that would be B. Number 17, what is the hydrogen concentration if the pH is 8.66, another typo. Uh, I assume you guys understood that because you didn't ask me about it during the test. But pH is 8.66. Well, that's going to be the opposite equation. So 10 to the negative pH gives us H plus concentration. Okay. 
So 10 raised to the negative 8.66 gives us that. Um, and my calculator says 2.19. I'm not going to be too concerned about significant digits here. Oh, not the 19th, just the 9th. Boop. And that's molar because it's in brackets. Um, that would be A. 18. Uh, we got a data table with some KAs listed. Oh, good. So we didn't have to look them up. Okay, so we're looking for what's dissociating the most, it says. That means it's the strongest acid. More ions, strongest acid. Okay, so that's my logic there. So in order to have the strongest acid, I want to have the biggest Ka. That means products are formed. More. All right, um, so when I'm looking for the biggest Ka, it's always in scientific notation. So what I'm looking for really is the one that has the smallest exponent. Smallest negative exponent is what I'm looking at. That's my logic. So I have 10 to the negative 4, 10 to the negative 2, 10 to the negative 3, 10 to the negative 8. So it's going to be B. That 10 to the negative 2 is a bigger number, which means more products, more H plus being formed. Right. Next page is our short answer section. Okay, so your answers may vary in, in these places. I give partial credit for whatever you've accomplished. All right. Um, so the first one is about the Haber-Bosch process. We studied this. This is how ammonia is made, and that's a large proportion of our energy usage. You start with nitrogen gas. Nitrogen is a diatomic element, so I always have to have N2, not just N. And we're going to react that with hydrogen, also a diatomic it's in equilibrium. If you put a straight across the arrow, you're probably going to lose about a quarter of a point for that. Um, because it's not, you know, it's in equilibrium. And we're producing ammonia, which is NH3. Now, of course, i got to balance this. So, let's see, i got two nitrogen. I have two hydrogen. On the other side, I have ammonia. Oops. So right now I've only got one nitrogen, so I have to put a two in front of it because I needed two from the left. And over here I've got two hydrogen and I've got six. So we're going to have to put a three there. Okay, so that fixes it. That's the balanced reaction for the Haber-Bosch process. It's just nitrogen plus hydrogen gets us ammonia. Oops, I was trying to change the color. Here we go. Okay, so that's letter A. This is going to be worth um, two points. And you can lose it for not balancing correctly or for not having subscripts or not having states of matter. Oops. <laughs> Speaking of which, uh, having the wrong kind of arrow. So there's a lot of little kind of nitpicky things that can happen on your reactions. Pay attention to those things. They matter. Because of course if I didn't have th these were gases, it wouldn't be uh, you can apply Le Chatelier's principle fully uh, without that information. You can't apply it at all if the arrow was wrong. Okay. Now, they want us to calculate a Kp, so I like to define that before I plug in any numbers. It's products. Oh, well, you know, it's not a concentration, so it would be more accurate to use pressures here, so I'll do that. So we're going to call the pressure of the ammonia, and that's going to be squared because it has a coefficient of 2. This is why the balanced reaction is important. And on the bottom we'll have pressure of hydrogen cubed and pressure of nitrogen. It's not raised to any power. Okay, and so now they give us concentrations. So 1.3 atmospheres, not concentrations, pressures. That's going to be squared. My hydrogen is, oh, coincidentally I put everything in the same order. That's funny. Hydrogen's there, and then nitrogen is 3.4. Uh, I don't write the units for a problem like this just to keep it a little bit more clear, but you probably should. We know the Ks don't really have units, so I don't emphasize it too much. So just so you can see how I do the math, I, I solve the square and the cube here, and then, um, and then I'll do the division. 
You don't have to show this many math steps. Uh, I want to see this and I want to see your answer at least. I'm just showing it to you in case somewhere along the way um, something got messed up. Oh, there's not any exponential notation. That's just 7.75 is our KP. That means it favors products a little bit more than reactants, which is what we, we can see here based on our relationships. Okay. Um, let's see. So this one's going to be worth one point for setting up your, your statement here. Uh, one point for this, plugging everything in correctly. And um, I'm not going to emphasize sig fig, so really this will just be two points. All right, so C, we're going to find the Kc of the reaction based on the Kp, because we just calculated it. So I know we have on our formula sheet a handy equation that, that relates Kp and Kc. It goes like this. Okay, so we know Kp, it's 7.75. I'm trying to find Kc. R is going to be our friend, the ideal gas constant. In this case, I'm dealing with atmospheres, so we're going to use this version. If I were dealing with energies, we would use the other one. Um, and it says at 500 K. The delta N comes from our balanced reaction, so the change in moles of gas, this is just for gases, is going to be final minus initial. So in this case, we have two in the final position and four initially, three hydrogen, one nitrogen. So your delta N up here is going to be a negative two. Okay, so I need to see this work set up like, you know, defining all your variables and whatnot. Um, a lot of the time people will just do the multiplication and not show me the answer and I'm okay with that but I'm going to show it to you so that if there was an error, you can figure out where. Whoa. <laughs> My tablet got a little bit off there. Okay. So it's 41.03 for the parentheses, and we said 2 minus 4 is negative 2. So I'm going to take that and raise it to the negative 2. And so that becomes 0 0.000594. And then, of course, it's going to be 7.75 divided by that number. And we get a big KC. That's what the calculator says. There's some decimals after it. I'm going to ignore them. We only really have like two sig figs. I'm not going to emphasize sig figs on the case because of the logarithm and any units are weird. So that's not an emphasis. But you do need to show me setting up the formula correctly, including calculating delta N. That's one point, and then the formula is one point, and then your math. So this one's going to end up being three. All right, so 20. Um, okay, so we're talking about pH of beverages and citric acid. Right away, I am going to look at Appendix D and find out what that is. That's not our appendix. There it is, citric acid. There it is. It has three Ka's, but here's the formula. H3C6H5O7. That's citric acid, okay. It wants us to write the hydrolysis for the loss of the first proton. Okay, well I could have anticipated there would be multiple Ka's based on that statement. Um, this does not have a charge because it is the fully protonated, it's the acidic uh, species. A hydrolysis is when you react it with water, so I'm going to add water. This is a weak acid or it wouldn't have been listed in the K, uh, in the appendix there with Ka. Uh, it's an acid though, so it's going to donate its hydrogen and that leaves us with two of them two acidic hydrogens. These five are not acidic. They're attached to the carbon, so they're not going to come off. And if it donates the hydrogen, that's going to make hydronium ion, which makes sense because we've added hydrogen, which is positively charged. This is going to be negative now because it lost a hydrogen. All right, and uh, so then it wants us to show 
what's an acid and a base? Well, this is an acid because it's called citric acid, which means this has to be a base. If we were going in the reverse direction, this is the one that's going to get rid of its, its proton, its extra proton. We know that this conjugate can be a, an acid. It could react with another water, but that's not what we're reacting with here. So if we're going in the reverse direction, then this acid donates the proton and we get this is going to be our base. So then our conjugates are going to be these two, these two pairs. Okay, so the reaction is going to be two points and then identifying the correct acid base situation here is going to be one point, so that's three. Uh, letter B, we want to write the equilibrium expression, so that's going to be a Ka or a Keq. It's going to be products with charges, don't neglect your charges, divided by the reactants. Now except we don't include water. Why? Because it's a pure substance and it does not impact, the concentration of the water does not impact the reaction, so we're going to ignore it. Um, that's it. Okay. Then in C, it says we have a concentration of 4.6% m slash v. This means mass per volume, so usually grams per milliliter or kilograms per liter, one of those two. Usually in the lab we go with grams and milliliters. we got to go to molarity from there. Oh, all right. So if it says 4.6%, I can automatically, you can either assume a volume and figure out how many grams of citric were there, or you can remember that 4.6%, the percentage part, is your solute on top divided by solution on the bottom. So it'd be 100 milliliters in this case. I got the units from M slash V, so grams and milliliters. Okay. Um, so all I got to do is figure out the molar mass of citric and then I can figure out how many moles there are. So what do we got? Eight hydrogens all together, uh, six carbons, and seven uh, oxygen. So that's going to be 192. 0.14 grams per mole. I put moles on top because that's what I'm trying to calculate. So here we got 0 0.0239. This is my last significant digit, but I'm going to keep one extra until I'm done calculating everything. Moles of citric. In order to get a molarity, I gotta know the liters of solution, so that's gonna be 100 milliliters converted. So, all together, these two things come together and we go 0 0.0239 moles divided by 0 0.1 liters will be our molarity. So, 0.239. I have to round that because I only have two sig figs, so 2,4. All right, so sig figs are usually half a point. Uh, you're going to get one point for showing this one, one point for showing that one, and one point for showing that one. And uh, half a point for this. You can arrive at this part in different ways. You can plug it into the formula and calculate it, give it a, an assumed volume, all kinds of different ways. So overall, this, this entire problem is going to be worth four points. Oh, this one up here will be worth one. Okay, so now D. So this is still 20. It says calculate the hydronium ion concentration at equilibrium, and it suggests using the simplifying assumption. So, first off, I want to just copy our equation. Okay, so here's the same equation. Uh, the 3 is not relevant. That was from the prior slide that I copied. Okay, so. I need to calculate um, 
H plus concentration. So really the hydronium over here is what I'm trying to calculate. Um, initially, we have a molarity from the last problem. It was 0.24 of our um, citric acid. Concentration of water doesn't matter. I don't know how much this is. Initially, it's gonna be zero, of course, but once it comes to equilibrium, we're gonna to have to shift forward because we can't have an equilibrium without product. So we're gonna subtract some of the reactant and add an equal amount of product because we don't have any coefficients. So at equilibrium, we end up with these statements. So our Ka is still good. It was products over reactants, right? So in this case, that's gonna simplify to x squared divided by 0.24 minus x. And the problem says not to do the quadratics, so I'm just going to assume this is insignificant on the bottom, and we're gonna ignore it. And then I look up the Ka value. Now, this is the loss of the first proton, so of course we're gonna use Ka1, 7.4 times 10 to the negative four. Don't get caught in the trap of making this more complicated than it is. We are at the first proton, so we're gonna use the first Ka. If we were losing the second proton, we'd use the second Ka. So this is going to simplify. I'm going to multiply by 0.24 first. So we get x squared equals 0.24. Okay. Um, you don't have to show every single math step, but I do need to see the equation here set up initially. That's important. So we get x squared is 0.0001776. Hey, that's the same year we signed our constitution, I think. That's funny. I know, my brain's a weird place. And then I'm going to do the square root of that in order to figure out what x is. So square root of both sides. And so x is 0.0133. 266, but I'm, I think I'm good there because I've only got two significant figures anyways. That's going to be a molarity because X is uh, based on our starting unit. Um, that makes sense. If I take 0.24 and subtract 0.01, it doesn't change the concentration very much. So our assumption is probably safe. Um, so our concentration of hydronium ion is... So for this problem, you're going to get two points for the icebox being set up correctly uh, and two points for doing the math down here, so four total. And then it says calculate the pH of the beverage. Okay, well, so negative log of that. My cursor's kind of lagging a little bit. I don't know why. It's kind of weird. Um, so we get 1.88. Oh, that's pretty acidic. It's quite a lot of hydrogen ion. Okay. So. That's it. Alright, so as... Oh, no, that's not it. We got one something on the back. Oh, oops. Uh, part 3 is, is hydrolysis problems. So we're given Na2CO3. Hey, that's kind of similar to the one we had in the beginning. So if you did this already, then, you know, it should be pretty straightforward. So the dissociation is when we break that up. It goes all the way because sodium is always soluble, and that becomes two sodium ions because we have two to start with. So it still has to be balanced. We also get a carbonate ion. And then we take the cation and react it with water. The cation, of course, is sodium. I don't care if you use the two or not, it doesn't matter. Just to keep it off just to simplify. If sodium did react, uh, it would produce, let's see, it's positive, so it's going to be attracted to the OH part. It would produce hydrogen as well. Uh, that's a strong base, so this reaction does not happen. No reaction. The anion is the carbonate, and anions, when they react, if they react, uh, like to grab onto the H plus. 
so that means we've got a minus one since I added a positive charge and it was a minus two originally. Um, and so if I took a hydrogen, I'm going to leave behind a hydroxide. This is weak. Uh, you can look on the table that's included in your test packet. But this is weak, which means this reaction does indeed occur. All right, so your pH is not neutral. It's going to be basic because it makes OH minus. Two is ammonium bromide. So the dissociation would produce ammonium ion and bromine ion. The cation will react with water. So this is, again, very similar to one of the questions in the beginning. Uh, you could write this two ways. Again, you could do it as NH4OH. It likes to grab onto that negative and leave behind a hydrogen ion. Or you can think of it as NH donating its extra. Either way, you make acid. And that one does happen. That's weak. It's right on the reference table. The anion is bromine. It would make hydrobromic acid and hydroxide. So if this happens, it would be basic. Uh, but this doesn't happen because that's a strong acid. So no reaction there. So here this one is going to produce H+, which means it's going to be acidic. Okay, so for each one of these you get like basically one point for each step, so four per question, so this whole page will be worth eight. All right, so if you have any questions, please feel free to email me, come to my office, talk about these problems. It's important to understand the mistakes you make so that they don't happen again.